Um, thanks for coming to ReasonConf. Um, and I also want to thank uh, DraftBit and Mike for putting this event on. Um, it's really incredible what you've done. I really appreciate it, and so does everyone else. Also, thank you to, to all of the sponsors that, um, that pitched in and helped make this event possible. So I'm Jordan, and uh, I want to talk about React and Reason today. So I work on programming languages and frameworks at Facebook on the Ads Interfaces team. And you know, you might ask, why do I work on this stuff? So my ultimate goal, or at least my personal goal, is to build an application that is fast and that doesn't break when it's extended. And I keep finding that it's just way, way too hard to do that. So I end up working on languages and frameworks with the goal of being able to make that job easier, but really I just want to use those tools myself. And um, we have a long ways to go. No matter what we do, it always seems like there's, uh, there's so much low-hanging fruit making the app developer's experience better. But we have made some progress. I've been able to participate in some of these projects as well. So in 2011, I created the React.js framework. Then I shifted my focus to mobile, where I co-founded the React Native project with three other people. And most recently, I started the Reason effort and with other coworkers and the community, I helped build out a lot of the tooling that makes up the Reason ecosystem. So what is Reason? Reason is a fast and safe programming language based directly on OCaml. So the way I like to think about it is that Reason brings the ideas and the principles that you like about React to the whole language. But most importantly, I see it as a way to unlock a much more ambitious future for UI development. All right, so React. We open source React in 2013, and Tom Okino and I presented at JSConf. And I haven't really done a lot of conference talks since then, but I do go to a lot of meetups. And I talk to a lot of people, and I hear the stories about people adopting React. And a lot of the stories have something in common. People say, React made my job fun again. And I think that's really cool feedback, and I try to think about why is that. I don't really think it's because React provides like out of the box IDE integration and you know, an abundance of packages that they can just pull down immediately. Although all that stuff is really great and we should strive for it. I think that something deeper is going on. I think that React is putting a new idea about how to build apps into people's brains. And it's that core idea that feels rewarding to people. The idea is really simple. It's just that you should minimize application state and minimize side effects. We don't need to go, go to the extreme with it, but that's just the general guiding principles of React. And I think that that idea is what feels rewarding to people. So people might not always express it like this, but you know, they might say things like, I really like that React is composable. I feel like I can just stack my components together and it feels like I'm you know, playing with building blocks, basically. Or they might say, I really like that with React apps, my code is easier to reason about. It sounds like an opinion. Um, and it's not really clear what people mean when they say reason about. But I think I have a pretty good idea what they're trying to say. When you can reason about something, it means that you can look at a small part of your code and you can understand a majority of the complexities and the interactions there without having to keep the whole entire program in your brain at once. So it's easy to reason about. Um, now building apps this way, the way that React encourages minimizing side effects and state, that makes your app easier to reason about and it sounds like an opinion, but it's more than an opinion because it's also something that you can measure. So take this example here. This is a React component and it renders an array of friends and for each friend it's going to render a div and it's gonna print their name inside of that div, but then it's gonna wrap the whole thing in a container and we have an event handler on the outer container that says, whenever you click on anything in here, we're gonna send a message to the user saying, this is how many friends you have. All right, but notice something interesting about this. Time can elapse between when you render that list initially and when that event handler occurs. A lot can happen in that time. What if somebody were to add an additional friend to that array? Just mutate it out from under you. Maybe they remove a friend. Well, then that message that you send to the user is going to be out of sync with the list that the user sees on the screen. That's mutation. 
All right, so imagine you're in a really complicated code base. It's really big and it uses lots of mutation everywhere. Now imagine trying to go through, you know, in your head, look at this code and determine whether or not that mutation could happen. Turns out it's really hard. So first of all, you have to go to every other module that calls into yours. And you've got to confirm that after they pass that array to your component, they don't go and mutate that later. Okay, that can be pretty time consuming, but it's worse. You also have to go find any other module that your calling module passes that array to and confirm that they also don't mutate that array. That was, that's complicated and difficult for me to even explain, so imagine trying to go through the actual code base and reason through that. All right, so contrast that with, if you know this array is not mutable, can never be mutated, some language or type system, it won't even allow you to do it. The problem becomes much simpler. This is all you have to keep in your head to understand almost completely how this component works. You can reason about it. So programming like this, you know, it allows you to experience many small wins when you're programming. It's kind of like your brain gets this, uh, this reward every so often and you're confident with what you've achieved. It makes programming fun. It's kind of like a game. I think that that's what people are talking about when they say, React made my job fun. Okay. So React creates this pit of success where these kind of patterns, they're more easy, you know, they're easier to accomplish, they're more common. That's what the pit of success means. You, you just naturally fall into it. Now, a lot of purists might say, hey, I know the ways that you can circumvent these guardrails in React, and uh, I can make that array be mutated, and that's true. But there's no denying that compared to the alternative paradigms in UI programming, it's a huge improvement, and it was also a massive course correction for the direction that UI was heading in before React. So React has become bigger than any library at this point. It's really the idea of applying these timeless principles to the domain of UI programming. So it's interesting that a lot of these ideas, they feel new to people, but they're not. They're actually as old as computer science. So it made me wonder, like, what else did we miss, right? What's in store for the future of UI programming? So in order to project out into the future, I think it's really helpful to take a look at the history of programming languages, or at least the high-level programming languages, to see where some of these ideas originated from. In 1932, so we're going way back. Uh, in 1932, Alonzo Church discovered Lambda Calculus. So Lambda Calculus is the simplest possible programming language you could imagine, and its core construct is just a function with some lexical, lexical scoping. And really, it turns out that from this really simple idea of just a function that takes a single argument, and returns an expression, and then functions that you can apply, you can construct any computable program. That's interesting. So we're already starting to see the idea of computer programs being expressed as an expression that describes what the computer should do, instead of actually just doing it in a sequence of imperative mutations. This is really early. What's really amazing here, though, is that Lambda Calculus was discovered before the first programmable computer was ever invented. So that should tell us something. So this wasn't contrived out of the constraints of technological progress in the time. These ideas, they seem to be timeless. All right, so it's not just mathematical theory, though. In 1952, we see the invention of the Lisp programming language family, and we're able to take, which basically took Lambda calculus and made it human usable. And it's actually running on real hardware at that point. But then, as time went on, more people developed and collaborated together. There's this increased demand for type systems and a way to automatically prove or, you know, reject bad programs ahead of time before you ship them. Sounds like a good idea to me. So Roger Hanley and Robin Milner invented the ML family of programming languages by creating the Hindley milner type system. So contrary to popular belief, ML does not stand for machine learning. <laughs> but what's really cool about ML is that it, it really pioneered a really great uh, type system where types weren't a burden. You don't have to always write them, so the compiler can infer them in most cases. 
That's really great because a lot of type system skeptics might say, yeah, but static typing has all these benefits, but it's a huge burden. I have to always write them out everywhere. It ruins the rapid development. It's not so. So ML is like the overall family of languages that uh, standard ML, OCaml, and Elm all descend from. So it looks like we're innovating at this really rapid pace here. Went from no computers even existing to actually amazing type systems in like 40 years. So if you project out into the future, I mean, in 40 years from now, how amazing is it going to be? I mean, everybody's going to be using these awesome technologies, right? Well, apparently something had gone terribly wrong from 1973 to 2010 because when I started working as a web app developer, we weren't using all of these awesome paradigms. We weren't programming in patterns that were easy to reason about. We weren't even using static type systems at that, at that time. And we were using actually two dynamic languages, JavaScript, and uh, on top of that, one of them was PHP. So, and we also had these like kind of, kind of crazy um, server setups where we would render this markup on the server, we'd send it across the wire, and we'd try to sprinkle some JavaScript on it on the client, you know, with the hopes of making the static document somewhat interactive. You know, it's easy to kind of uh, bash this, but at the time, this was the status quo. This was how everybody built web apps. The worst part about it, though, was that everything was based on mutation. So that means if you wanted to change the color of something, you just reach out to that DOM node and you just tell it to change the color. And then if somebody else wants to do the same thing, then they'll also do that. And then hopefully, well, I don't know who wins. Um, there's really no order to it. So I started creating several prototypes of what we now call the React.js library. So React didn't just solve one problem. I know it's good to just solve one problem, but React actually solved multiple problems at once. Kind of made it confusing to explain to people, like, here's the value of React. But, um, but it did solve several. So first, it allowed us to render that markup on either the server or the client. We didn't have to decide up front. So that means that you can um, render all your app on the client, and then if the constraints change, maybe you're in a different area where network location or you know, network bandwidth is less or latency is higher, you can switch to rendering that on the server. But the coolest thing about React is that it brought the ideas of functional programming and immutability to a wide audience. Some people might not really like to, uh, to admit that, but you know, they might say, oh, you know, I never said I liked functional programming or anything. Um, and that's fine. I think we should meet people, people where they are. And I find that if you just call it declarative programming, it just, it's an easier pill to swallow. It's like they don't have to question their, uh, their identity as a programmer or anything. <laughs> Okay, so I showed some of these earlier prototypes of people. And um, this is more or less what it looked like. A couple of renames are different there, but um, when I showed this to people, I was hoping we'd have a great conversation about all the ideas of React. You know, this is a good idea, that's not a good idea, maybe poke some holes in it. But it didn't go down like that. So when I showed this to people, what, what a large percentage of them saw in their heads was this. <laughs> this endless stream of closing brackets and braces. So it turns out that developers at Facebook at the time, so they were used to this, uh, this dialect of PHP where you can embed XML inside of your code. Okay, so I kind of listened to that feedback and I dusted off some diffs from Adam Hupp and some old parsers by Marcel and I pieced together this diff where I implemented JSX as we, as we know it today inside of React. So it looked like this. What's cool is that this wasn't like a fundamental change or anything. All, all we were doing was just taking this and then turning it exactly into what we saw before. Literal just function calls. You, you just do it at the parse time almost. So I thought, okay, that's great. And it, I mean, the difference in reception was night and day. People were like, whoa, that looks great. So what's this React about? Um, you know, because we could actually get past this initial friction here and talk about the real ideas that matter. So React gained some adoption internally and um, it looked like it was going pretty well, and we decided it's time to open source React. And so all we had to do was just show the world what we built, and then you know, we'll get the same kind of enlightened response that we had internally. <laughs> That's what I thought. Until I got to this slide, where I showed the syntax that we were using. 
And uh, it's kind of funny because I remember looking out at the audience and just seeing this sea of furrowed brows and like angry faces and people were just like visibly upset. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what's, what did I say? Do they, just, do they just really not like immutability or something? Um, <laughs> And so we talked with some people out after the conference, and it turns out that they really didn't, um, they took issue with our syntax extension. And, uh, you know, it's water under the bridge. Um, you know, there were some harsh words on Twitter, which we, we don't really need to relive right now. But, um, you know, eventually people got over it, and they were able to see the ideas of React, and we could talk about that, and that's important. So some people might say, all right, syntax, yeah, it can be an issue at first, but if I just persist through it, if other people just persist through it, you know, they'll get over it. They'll see the real value behind your technology. And that's true. But I like to think about pushing new technology, kind of like, I think of it like pushing a really heavy stone on the ground. And you have two, kind of friction, two kinds of frictions that you're working against here. You have static friction and kinetic friction. So static friction tells you how hard you have to push this thing initially to get it moving, and then kinetic friction tells you how hard you, or how much more energy you need to put into the system to keep it moving once it's already in motion. And so you might think, oh yeah, this stone is really great, and if people just push the initial phase, you know, they'll see how great it is afterwards. But the problem is, there isn't just one stone. So every day on Hacker News, you have 20 stones, all telling you, you know, this is gonna solve your problems. And some of these stones, they don't have any kinetic, or they don't have any static friction at all. You can just start pushing them right now. So people don't have to trust them that the technology is going to deliver once they invest. So that's what you're working against. The other problem is that you're not the only one pushing. So you want to get coworkers, project contributors on board. You want to get them ramped up. You want them to take a look at your project and send a pull request. So it's not really just about you. It's about what other people think too, and that matters. So my suggestion is to ruthlessly remove all of the static friction that you can in your technologies. And so the core lesson that we learned from just the open sourcing process of React and the internal adoption is that syntax matters. It really does. It's really highly subjective, but it matters because it influences the outcomes. And that's what we care about. All right, so fast forwarding six years, We've open source React, you know, it's grown, it's become popular. Um, there's a full-time team dedicated to innovating React, maintaining it, improving it. And they're doing a killer job. React has a quarter billion, quarter billion downloads per year from NPM. If you were to count all of the downloads from the content delivery and, you know, all the way to the client machines, it's, it's well into the billions per year. I haven't ever really calculated it, but... All right, so React brings better patterns to your components. Sounds great, but where do we go from here? Is that all we can do? What about the rest of your code base? What about your code that isn't components? What about static types? That was that other problem that seemed unsolved in 2010. That's something that only a language should really solve. If we're going to embrace a new language, we really want one that matches React. So Reason brings what people like about React to the programming language level, to the rest of their code base. It picks up where React left off. So for example, remember all that pain that, immu or that mutation brought to our render function earlier? Well, in reason by default, records are immutable. That means you know that it, nothing, in the field, nothing in the fields can be changed. But most importantly, you can trust that. So all you have to do is just hover over something in your IDE and you can tell this can't possibly be mutated. You don't have to wonder. So you can see that Reason already brings this local reasoning back to you. But Reason isn't just for the purists because you can also opt into mutability as well. So in this case, these fields are mutable. Now I can actually update it there. My immutable settings dot is admin equals true. 
So that looks a lot like JavaScript. Well, you know, if it wasn't clear, Reason is designed to be immediately usable by JavaScript developers, or really anybody from any of the other popular, popular languages as well. So this example here that we saw with the list that we were rendering, that's both valid JavaScript, JSX, and valid Reason. So hey, you already know a little bit of Reason. You can imagine how, you know, how much easier that makes it to get your coworkers on board. But it's not just JavaScript. So it also includes some features beyond JavaScript, like pattern matching, which is kind of like a, a turbocharged switch statement that's totally type-based, and it allows you to express um, Redux-style state transitions really naturally, like it's embedded into the language, because it is. And it also catches a bunch of other kind of errors and bugs that you would have in these kind of situations. Like, let's say, I, well, in this case, I forgot to cover one state here. Like, what if uh, the event type is an escape, but you're already logged in? Well, I didn't cover that. Well, this is my terminal output that I see when I forget to cover that. It says, hey, here's an example of a case that's not matched. So it has all these kinds of um, these additional checks statically guaranteed at compile time. It's really helpful. Okay, so how does all this work? How is this type system so good? Um, did this just come out of nowhere? Well, no. When you're looking at reason, behind the scenes, it's actually OCaml, one of those ML languages. So you might ask, okay, well then, is, is reason the OCaml language? Well, yeah, sort of. I guess it depends on what you mean by language, right? So what is in a language? A language is a lot of things. It's the, the community, the package manager, libraries, patterns, use cases, all of these things that matter. But most importantly, a language is at the heart the compiler. So what's in a compiler? I'm going to totally reduce this down to an absurd level here, but you can think of it in, in a few stages. Um, the front end, which you know, it describes the syntax and how you actually interact with it. The middle stage, which is type, the actual type system where it implements and, and implementing of the semantics. And then the back end, which is like actually rendering out the machine code or the JavaScript, whatever you're compiling to. So Reason starts by replacing the syntax of OCaml with one that is immediately usable by JavaScript developers. Okay, so why start with syntax? Well, I mean, if we saw anything, if we learned anything from the story of React, it's that syntax matters. It's the UI of your programming language. So there's some quotes from people that I just randomly pulled from, from Twitter. Um, to me, the syntax, the familiar syntax was originally what lit my interest in reason. I did some exploration of reason and some time ago and it was super intuitive to write in. So this is some of the stuff that we're hearing. But not everybody likes this syntax because, I mean, you, there's no syntax that everybody likes. But if you consider just who we're targeting, it makes a lot of sense because the JavaScript developer community is huge. It's massive. And so if you want to gain adoption in a technology, you want to remove friction for the largest set of people at once, static friction, even if it means maybe increasing friction for a tiny, a relatively tiny uh, set of the entire world of programming. It's a worthy trade-off. OK, but then, I mean, it gets kind of confusing because a lot of people use Reason with BuckleScript. So, which replaces the back end of OCaml with one that emits idiomatic JavaScript that you can check in and that your coworkers won't yell at you for. So, I mean, at this point, um, when it's used this way, more of the OCaml compiler is replaced with, with uh, parts of the tool chain that JavaScript developers want. But importantly, it's still OCaml exactly where you want it to be, in that battle-tested, hardened type system. Okay, so I mentioned compiling to JavaScript. Um, there's going to be other awesome talks about that at this conference, but um, you know, this might sound kind of like a radical proposal. Like, you're going to change my, the way I, you know, I develop my JavaScript code base? It sounds like a radical departure. Well, I would say I'm not really so sure about that. I mean, ever since we open source React, people have been using JSX. And that's not even valid JavaScript. It won't run in the browser. So people have to compile it into JavaScript to run it in the browser. So you're a compiled to JS language user. So now we're just talking about trade-offs in compilers. Like, which one would you want if you're developing React apps? 
I'm more interested in arguments and discussions about, um, about the kind of potential that we can unlock for developers. I'm not really interested in you know, talking, you know, biasing towards the status quo, because if we did that, we'd still be rendering PHP on the server, and we wouldn't have React. So if you imagine and you visualize the, the potential that a JavaScript programmer has today in the JavaScript ecosystem, React definitely improved a large portion of that. So anything related to UI and interactions, develop, the developer's life improved, and um, their code was easier to reason about. It didn't solve all the problems, and that's, it wasn't supposed to. So the way I think about reason is that it brings the things that people like about React to the entire language, so that every use case in the JavaScript ecosystem benefits from those same core ideas. But what's often, too, but what's, uh, often missing from this discussion is the person who matters most. Who matters most? The user. The user, yeah. I mean, you know, Reason and React both improve the user experience because users don't like bugs. So the fact that Reason can prevent a large class of that ahead of time, that's great. What else do users care about? Performance. Performance, right. Exactly. So if you take a step back, you look at the entire world of programming, you realize how big it really is. So there's a lot of people building tools or building applications with Rust, C, Go. What are they doing? Why are they doing that? What part of always bet on JavaScript do they not understand? <laughs> it turns out there's some pretty good reasons. Users want faster startup time. They want better utilization of their hardware. They want more predictable performance, faster execution, more throughput. They appreciate that, and they notice. JITs can be amazing, just-in-time compilation, but they're also pretty unpredictable, too, because they rely on heuristics that are really hard to pin down ahead of time, hard to guarantee throughout the, all the workflows of your app that you didn't test. So when you want to provide the best user experience, you can't always afford the complexity of the JavaScript language. JS developers can sometimes be in a kind of denial about this. And don't get me wrong, I totally understand the appeal of pushing JavaScript in the VM to its limits, especially if you're in the case or in the scenario where you also want to, you also want to deploy a large part of your code base to the web. So historically, that means you have to target, you have to write in JavaScript, deploy it to the web. Now you're in this situation where you have this existing code, this existing knowledge. But you also need to run it, run it in all these other environments where a JavaScript VM wasn't even required to begin with. So the appeal there is, well, I want to take this code and I want to use it in all these other use cases, even if those other use cases are more demanding. So, so developers, they're, they're in this trade-off where I want to target web. I also want more constrained environments I want to cover all the bases. So you're in a situation where you have to learn web development today. And then if you want to cover these other use cases, you're faced with a choice. Completely learn from ground up in this other stack in another language that serves these other use cases better, import everything I wrote in JavaScript over there, keep it in sync, or I can just let the user take the hit. I can push JavaScript beyond its limits, maybe past its breaking point. It makes sense why this is happening. Ultimately, any library that's authored in JavaScript is held captive by JavaScript. It can really only be used in so many scenarios. And if you don't believe me, just ask all those people in the right column there. But here's what's so cool about Reason. Even if you're just writing Reason targeting the web today, all those skills, they transfer to a huge portion of those other native use cases that are more constrained. And there's no such thing as one language that can do everything. Right? Um, there's going to be use cases so demanding that you, know, you need to drop down to low level C 
And there's going to be other cases still where even that's not good enough and C adds too much overhead and you have to write manual assembly. Hopefully none of us ever have to do that. But, oh, there's also going to be cases where, you know, the, the current feature set of the OCaml native compiler, it's not really well matched to that use case. So there's definitely a lot of room there. But what I've noticed is that a lot of the systems that people are building where, you know, you, you want a fast command line app, you want a fast server, it's actually really well suited by the native OCaml tool chain. A huge portion of them. Because it produces fast executables that start up instantly. Sounds almost too good to be true. Except it's already happening. Here's just a couple of examples that I pulled from the community. FNM, uh, we mentioned that earlier, it's Fast Node Manager. That is a node version manager that is so fast you can put it in your shell and you'll never notice it. This happens instantly. Another one is ONI2. So ONI2 is a rewrite of ONI1, but this time it's based, um, well, it's always been based on Vim, but this time the GUI is based on Reason Native. So these projects, they have a serious advantage when they're competing against other ones that are written and authored in JavaScript. Just because of the performance alone. And performance is an incredibly important feature to users. So here's some quotes just pulled randomly off Twitter um, about Oni. It's crazy performant, like scary fast. I actually didn't know an app could start that fast on my Mac. Did I click? It already started. Um, and so what's cool is that all these projects, and there's many more too, uh, they were started or contributed uh, to by people from the web community, from the web ecosystem. That's a lot of potential that we're unlocking. We also use Reason Native on my team as interfaces at Facebook. We compile our Reason modules to JavaScript using BuckleScript compiler, but then we also compile them natively to native executables so that we can run them extremely fast in our testing environment. We don't have to spin up a JavaScript VM to actually run our tests. So it's very interactive. We do that using Rely, which is a, a testing framework inspired by Jest, but meant for native Reason. It's part of a larger set of utilities that we've open sourced called Reason Native, which brings a lot of the node utilities and the node style of, of uh, libraries and programming to Reason Native. You can check it out there. So why was Native hard? I mean, looking at the history, if you ever tried to compile a C++ program, it's a nightmare. Usually involves, you know, installing 20 global things on your machine you didn't have before. Oh, but you need that for another project. Uh, so it conflicts with that, and you're editing make files and environment variables for like hours before you can even get the thing to build. So why was that? Well, native builds have historically not uh, completely automated and modeled all the dependencies that are required. It's just part of the culture in a lot of the previous native programming. So there's no one click there. It's too easy for package authors to accidentally rely on something on their specific machine that you don't have on yours, and so you spend all your time trying to recreate that package author's machine setup and environment on your machine, and it's, hopefully it's documented, it might not be. So because of the, that lack of automation, it's really difficult to get pre-built artifacts to other people or even on your own machine across projects. So these are some of the things that make it native hard or slow or painful. So what are we doing under the reason umbrella to improve things? Well, if we want to get web developers on board with the native devel development workflows, we need something that's familiar. It's got to be one click. We need something that's easy. So Andre Pop has been building something called Easy. Um, easy is, a, is like the one easy button that you need to press to automate, to speed up, and perform native builds. It feels just like NPM package management also, actually. You got a package JSON, you specify your dependencies. So really any web developer can just get started really quickly and they immediately know how to navigate the project. But it's not NPM. It doesn't use NPM. It doesn't use Yarn. It is a complete re-implementation of a package management workflow. And it's implemented in Reason Native itself, so it's also really fast. It's really easy to use. You just type ESY in the command line when you're in a project and it'll just do everything. It'll build, install dependencies. It's actually cr pretty incredible what's happening there. I think of it as like a React but for package management. So in the same way that we're bringing the ideas of React to the language of reason, we're bringing the ideas of React to the package management with easy. 
So when you run easy, it reconciles your project, fetches what needs to be fetched from the network, builds what needs to be built, and it does it really fast. But what's really cool is that it also caches those builds for your project and dependencies across all your projects. So the more you use it, the faster it gets when you're, when you're developing native. It uses some code from OCaml's package manager, OPAM, and also has integration with OPAM so that it can consume those packages and build them. And uh, it's really standing on the shoulders of giants here with both OCaml and OPAM and a lot of the research that went in there, including some of the Windows support. But also supports native C programs and C++ libraries. It also supports JavaScript packages. So it's really kind of one tool chain that can, can uh, do it all there. So Reason takes the ideas of React to the next level. And I see it as a way to unlock your potential as a developer because it allows you to learn one language that improves the user experience across a wide variety of use cases and constraints. So I want to leave you with one question. What could you build with Reason? Maybe you could build a really cool data fetching paradigm or framework that runs everywhere. Maybe you could build a new UI library. Maybe you could build what comes after React. Thank you.